fascinating book on Tagore, uh, the the less known side of his political philosophy. We know Tagore more as a Kavi guru and a Vishwa Kavi as a poet. Uh, the writer of the immortal lines where the mind is without fear and the head is held high. But what happened in those hundred years between uh, you know the first independence struggle in 1857 and by the time India gained independence in between the journey that uh, uh, Tagore had you know born in the year 1861 and being a Nobel laureate by 1913 and before that he was a well-traveled person and his vision of Vishwa Bharati uh, and uh, at Santi Niketan which was set up by his father as an ashram. So his uh, thought was of an east and west confluence and Professor Mukherjee has very well highlighted this in his book Political Ideas of Rabindranath Tagore. He was also a former head of department of political science at the University of Delhi. So Professor Mukherjee, uh, my first question is that recently uh, Shanti Niketan had been awarded as the World Heritage by UNESCO. So how much do you see that will make a difference to uh, whatever perceptions about uh, Vishwa Bharti and Shanti Niketan people have, uh, whether it needs to further modernize and how much it needs to adhere to the tradition and the vision and principles laid down by Rabindranath Tagore. Thank you. If you really look to the evolution of uh, Vishwa Bharati, you mentioned the role of Tagore's father. And uh, I'd also like to mention the role of the Zaminda who gave the land to him. And that's how he could start it. And uh, if you look to Tagore's evolution, you see, as you say, he was born in 1861 and uh, he was a Brahmo and uh, Brahmos in Bengal were highly educated and uh, liberal. And one aspect of Tagore that we should remember all the time that uh, he had a liberal mind and his thoughts had a basic pluralistic outlook of the envisaging are the positive points of all civilizations and uh, that's one reason that he thought of educational institution. And we really look to that when Tagore was very young, 21-22, he writes a poem, Nijar El Shopnavongo, and there he first time exhibits some kind of a blueprint of a Vishya Bharati. And there his theory as it develops in the poem, it's a beautiful poem, Ajiye Prabhate Robirka, that's how it starts. And uh, that all the rivers ultimately really meet in the ocean. And that is the first sign of his having some kind of a view which transcends localism and nationalism and also thinking in terms of a world civilization. He also admits that the civilization world, the equivalence is not in their, our language, but he tries to imbibe it, he tries to develop it. And if you really look to the Tagore's childhood, you see that uh, Gladstonian liberalism had a great deal of influence on him. That even if you come to crisis of civilization, you'll find a name John Bright. Who is this John Bright? Mm -hmm. He was an eloquent speaker, you know, and uh, people used to flock to the House of Commons to listen to his oratory. Yeah. And mind you, this is the time that Tagore is imbibing the best of Western by what I mean Western is the British, because that's what our limited acquaintance was. Tagore transcends that much later. But at that time, the important points that he imbibed was, uh, say, Edmund Burke, mm -hmm. Shakespeare, so Byron. So these are the things that he is yeah. trying to imbibe. 
and the most important point of that period that Tagore's optimism mm -hmm. and faith mm -hmm. that ultimately our salvation, our civilization progress will be facilitated by the British. Yeah. And that was the feeling. You remember that at the same time, Ram Mohan to Gokhale and the moderates, mm -hmm. they all thought that uh, the British rule was providential. Yeah. So Tagore never said it's providential. Mm -hmm. But he really thought that uh, India would progress much further yeah. with the help of the British and that by and large they will work towards India's freedom. And that was the uh, makeup of Tagore yeah. when he is young. He yeah. goes to England quite many times. He travels throughout the world as yeah. you say many times. But if you really look to the young Tagore, yeah. that is the basic philosophical framework that he provides. Yeah. But I like to point out here, by the time we come to the crisis of civilization, mm -hmm. there are many question marks in this earlier optimism of Tagore. Yeah. Okay, sure. So we'll come to that a little later. Uh, what I find very riveting is the deeper simplicity of the Nigerian poem that all the streams merge into the ocean. And I find it consistent in uh, not only Vishubharti, but also in many of his writings, for example, his challenge of the cult of Charkha, uh, or uh, you know, for example, uh, his uh, uh, Sri Niketan as for rural reconstruction, uh, in terms of the Swadesh Swaraj Mela that he organized. So there is a very holistic picture in which he tries to channelize the uh, bestiality of the Western civilization, and I'm sure. He would be aware of it at a younger age as well. I mean, he wasn't completely immune to the that uh, ugly side of the Western civilization. Yet he has this fond hope of a synergy that maybe the lacunas that he sees in the traditional Indian society would be filled in by the Glasgowian liberalism that you talk about. But that's where you know my point is that you know unlike Rudyard Kipling who talks about East is East and West is West and they should never meet. I think uh, what Tagore essentially drives at is that they would not meet at the material or the gross level, but the whole purpose of life, you know, the, the uh, merging into the ocean is also uh, metaphorically about, uh, you know, the Urdhmukhi, Mukhi, uh, the, the, the movement from material and gross levels to the subtle and spiritual level where there is abundance and where the twin shall meet. So while West will help uh, India with its growing population to meet its material needs with the industrial revolution better, which he was not very averse to and he welcomed it in many ways, yet his sense of frugality, which for me is the, you know, the magic word which is most misunderstood even with, by denizens of the present Vishubharti campus who I met just a fortnight back. So where do you think we lost track of that deeper simplicity of Vishubharti that you know while uh, may, uh, you know bringing the material well, wellness you know and uh, in my other conversations with you you also talked about how China uplifted 800 million people yet you know there has to be a fine line between where that gross material uh, you know extravagance needs to uh, we need to draw a line because if we don't draw a line then suddenly the planet's physical resources are limited we are we're going to run into conflicts and what we are essentially seeing in ukraine and every other place is essentially resource wars because we are not uh, we, we are kind of suffocating and stunting uh, what tagore saw as the creative unity and in uh, in various passages that i recollect this theme resonates that we must not get stuck with the material and gross level, but the journey of civilization must be to uplift humanity to the subtle and spiritual and feel the abundance and embrace the unbounded wholeness. So where do you think in the journey from, I would say 1921, just about 100 years back, uh, did it happen when the central university formed or did it happen before that or much later? Well, first I'd like to point out that even when uh, Tagore was young, even regarding England, he did not like uh, the way the Irish MPs were treated in the House of Commons. Yeah. 
and when the, he felt quite bad that they are being shouted out and their voices were not heard. And there is also a lot of concern regarding China and the opium trade. So Tagore was reflecting, yeah. you know, and what I said earlier was the broad view. Now coming to 1921, that uh, the, when the Vishwarati was uh, being thought of and then implemented, and in a smaller scale. If you really look to today's Vishwabharati and what Tagore was there at that time, there is hardly any comparison. The scale has changed and number of students have also grown very much. But why did Tagore establish Vishwabharati? That remains a question. But I'd like to point out that before that, in the early 20th century, two other universities also came up in India. One was the BHU, Benaras Hindi University, and Aligarh Muslim yeah. University. And it's very interesting that Tagore also reflected on them yeah. and supported both of them. Mm -hmm. But there also, there was a rider. He was worried about the exclusiveness of uh, either of them. And there he thought that the overriding fact mm -hmm. of uh, intermingling and inter-university cooperation yeah. will really make them universal. Mm -hmm. So that larger view of education remained with him. Yeah. And when he comes to Vishwabharati, he establishes at a center which will be very different from any other university in India. Mm -hmm. First point is that why did he think that a university like Vishwabharati can be established in India? The reason is that uh, he believes that the Indian civilization is very different from any other, actually uh, very different from the Western civilization. And here, you know, Bharatirtha, that is what India is, yeah. it welcomes everybody, mm -hmm. you know, whereas the Western civilization by and large is exclusive. He talks of the American Indians, mm -hmm. the way they were eliminated. Yeah. He talks of the problem of slavery and the, the Kipling you mentioned. But I, I'll remind you that when Kipling died, mm -hmm. he sent a condolence because his point was very simple. Mm -hmm. His views are at one set of things and his contribution to literature yeah. is another set of things. Sure. So Gandhi, uh, I mean uh, Tagore, had the finity, mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. of differentiating and really attributing the positive sides. Mm -hmm. So Vishwamarati is to be university, mm -hmm. which will defy a traditional university. Mm -hmm. And here I think there is an oblique critique of capitalism. Mm -hmm. That is uh, money mm -hmm. and uh, career mm -hmm. and any other thing should not really kill the spirit of real education, yeah. you see? Mm. And the real education will have certain nuances. Mm. One is that the every sector mm. of society mm. will be represented. Mm -hmm. And that's how the importance of Shanti Niketan and Sri Niketan. Mm -hmm. Mind you that when you talk of Shanti Niketan, we ignore Sri Niketan. That I think is grossly unfair yeah. dealing with Tagore. Because Sri Niketan is an integral part yeah. of the Vishwabharati system. Which you have beautifully brought out in the book. Uh, it's, 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 it's the most important. You know what he really detested of, before reading is the, book. the compartmentalization mm -hmm. of Indian society, right. the communal problem, mm -hmm. the caste problem. Yes. You see, there is to be a solution mm -hmm. to all these. And the solution orientation. Yeah will lead to a different mold of education. Right. For instance, mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. You know, Tagore is a great exponent of Indian mm -hmm. culture. You know, you look to his dance dramas. Mm -hmm. Even he goes to Manipur for it. He goes to other centers yeah. of India, mm -hmm. Chitrangada, right. dealing with the caste mm -hmm. problem. And uh, any, many other, Shama, you look to, yeah. the traditional Indian culture, the Upanishadic heritage, mm -hmm. All these things he imbibe yeah. and try to implement yeah. it. So the first important point is that it is to be a cultural center right. for excellence, mm -hmm. where dance, drama, mm -hmm. recitation, yeah. all will be an integral part of education yeah. 
towards a completeness. But there is also to be other important points. I think one of the places probably you visited is the China Bhavan. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, China Bhavan, you just imagine mm -hmm. in the 30s, yeah. Tagore conceives of it mm -hmm. and she builds it. So it is to be a center mm -hmm. of world culture. Mm -hmm. It is pluralism yeah. that is established and the mutuality, mm -hmm. the acceptance yeah. is the most, nothing called exclusive. Mm -hmm. So we'll build an institution yeah. where the cleavages mm -hmm. will not be there. Right. And you yeah. mentioned the uh, Tagore-Gandhi debate. Mm -hmm. One very important reason of the difference was this uh, exclusiveness and also a very different concept of power that he found in Gandhi mm -hmm. and also the lack of proper training mm -hmm. and the uh, involvement of the people. But then Gandhi Tagore is a very different topic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That will be some other day we can talk about. Right, it. yeah. So, coming to the point of Vishu Bharati being a confluence of East and West, and in today's global context, where uh, you know, an important office bearer, whether you, know, you consider the relevance of United Nations to be important today or not, but when Antonio Guterres at the Climate Ambition Summit in New York, just a week back on 20th of September uh, says that the climate crisis has been left so unattended when you know billions of people are affected that humanity has opened the gates to hell. So the last warning that Tagore gave in the crisis of civilization in the April 1941 essay just three months before his death you know which I would like to just read out uh, the passage for you know clarity. So it says that the spirit of violence which perhaps lay dormant in the psychology of the West, so he was very keenly aware of it, has at last roused itself and desecrates the spirit of man, which very well resonates what Oswald Spengler talks about in the decline of the West in 1921 uh, round. So the wheels of fate will someday compel the English to give up their Indian empire, which happened subsequently. But what kind of India will they leave behind? What stark misery? When the stream of their centuries administration runs dry, at last, what a waste of mud and filth. And now, of course, you know, so much of, you know, plastic and, uh, you know, toxic waste to add to that. Uh, uh, they will leave behind them. I had at one time believed that the springs of civilization would issue out of the heart of Europe. But today, when I am about to quit the world, that faith has gone bankrupt altogether. As I look around, I see the crumbling ruins of a proud civilization, strewn like a washed heap of utility. And yet, I shall not commit the grievous sin of losing faith in man. I would rather look forward to the opening of a new chapter in the history. After the cataclysm is over and the atmosphere rendered clean with the spirit of service and sacrifice, Perhaps that dawn will come when from this horizon, from the east where the sun rises, a day will come when unvanquished man will trace his path of conquest despite all barriers to win back his lost human heritage. So coming back to the actual uh, you know, unfolding of the geopolitical scenario in the uh, you know, third decade of the 21st century, uh, what we see in the East is on one hand the rise of China and of course the mellowing down of Japan you know which went on from being a very aggressive uh, nationalism which also you know brutalized parts of China and Korea uh, to uh, you know understand the uh, and become a very uh, living uh, critique of capitalism uh, the way Japan has you know really uh, kind of uh, pushed and shoved aside the, the notion of GDP growth and has gone for more of a degrowth. Uh, similarly, we see the rise of India in, in a very different fashion, uh, not so much materially. Uh, and, and if you cut out the overwhelming uh, uh, jingoist, jingoism that has, you know, uh, the Jai Shri Ram and uh, the various other facets of it, of uh, India becoming a world power, uh, there is uh, in terms of the society, uh, there is a certain 
capacity uh, of resilience to continue to uh, feed about uh, you know uh, the it's now the most populous country in the world as well as continue with its traditional ways of life a relative sense of harmony and uh, an ability to bounce back and uh, you know lead the world what uh, tagore envisaged so my question to you sir is that uh, you know connecting the dots from uh, you know crisis of civilization in 1941 to about 80 years later uh, do you see that uh, you know tagore uh, was uh, very rightly uh, able to uh, uh, you know uh, presage Uh, the coming uh, of uh, the rise of the east or do you see it's just as a false hope in his uh, you know twilight years you see crisis of civilization is the lecture he gave on his 8th year birthday and uh, he made couple of points there some of them you have mentioned but also he mentioned the colonial agony and the pain of being an indian that is clearly manifest in it he mentions persia that is iran he mentions afghanistan and uh, really talks of their freedom and uh, of course our subservience and he also mentions china and japan japan he mentions actually we have to understood Uh, understand tagore's view on japan dialectically that the rise of japan created lot of enthusiasm in india when tagore was a, uh, young and even subsequently you lead uh, uh, you read uh, gandhi's hind swaraj you find any number of mention of japan and uh, the subsequently it continued so what he says in the crisis of civilization is that india had the potential to be another japan you know but colonialism and the british brutality really kept us under developed it's another version of ramesh dat and noroji's drain theory mm-hmm. so he is very critical of that aspect yeah. that you have deliberately kept us under developed except maintaining law and order you see very powerful sentences are there mm-hmm. so it is he is looking to the contemporary situation and also looking to the japanese aggression mm-hmm. in china as you mentioned and then there is a long correspondence between tagore and noguchi mm-hmm. if you read at the same period you will find that tagore is clearly standing with china and not with japan's mm-hmm. aggression and rashmiari bosch even when he contacts tagore to support japan in second world war mm-hmm. he refuses to do it mm-hmm. so tagore is a libertarian mm-hmm. and tagore is also a constitutionalist mm-hmm. that also will find in this entire period 30s mm-hmm. he is talking of constitutional citizenship he is talking of the problems mm-hmm. and he blames the british for perpetuating divide and rule communalism he talks of the soviet union at that time and why soviet union because of two important things spread of education yeah. remember that tagore when he went to russia <laughs> in 1930 31 he called it a pilgrimage <laughs> he said my life will be incomplete yeah. unless i visit soviet union <laughs> and the soviet union his only purpose mm-hmm. was to see how education mm. is managed mm-hmm. of course tagore being a very perceptive mind yeah. could see the senior side of mm-hmm. the soviets and unlike uh, you know the beatrice so a kind of a new civilization mm-hmm. that she attributed mm-hmm. tagore thought of very critically mm-hmm. and i remember a beautiful sentence in tagore that uh, uh, Russia today Soviet Union today needs doctors care mm-hmm. and the the day is patient is free of the doctor that day is most welcome mm-hmm. so he could see the repression yeah. and the intolerance in Russia mm-hmm. but he applauded the things and actually mm-hmm. when he was in Russia there was a communal riot at Dhaka mm-hmm. and he was greatly disturbed by it so he attributes 
that at least communities can stay mm. together in Russia. There are no communal riots. Yeah. Education. Right. And he also mentions as a very important point, mm -hmm. equality. Yes. Equity. Yeah. He found mm -hmm. inequality revolting. Mm -hmm. And one reason of Shantiniketan yeah. and Sriniketan is to create life in the rural life of yeah. India. Yeah. That Gandhi also wanted. Right. But there is a big difference between Gandhi and Tagore. Mm -hmm. Tagore wanted commercial farming. farming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He wanted use of tractors. Mm -hmm. Mind you, he sent his son yeah. to Illinois mm -hmm. to study agriculture. Right. He sent his son-in-law mm -hmm. also abroad to write agriculture. And his stay in Shilai Daho, yeah. mm -hmm. that is in Bangladesh now, mm -hmm. that was Tagore's Jamindari. Mm -hmm. He tried his best to create social harmony and also to create, see that how farming can be improved yeah. and how commercialization can be done. And also there is another side of Tagore, which he talks to Kumarappa mm -hmm. in the 30s. And uh, there he says, look, the village craft, mm -hmm. the beauty of it, mm -hmm. that many of our things are in foreign museums. Why can't yeah. we bring them back? Why don't right. we create our own? Yeah. So, you know, Tagore is to be understood at and very that, different uh, levels. Economic poverty cannot happen without cultural poverty, the point that he makes. He says the rural craft should be appreciated. Right. It and is and just not an economic reason. Yeah. You see? There so is the cultural, cultural awareness side. of is rural right? areas should be equally emphasized and not just in the, the city cultural side. for their overall prosperity. Right. Is prosperity that, is to be yeah. there, you know. So, so what I self sufficiency to, is to be there. Yeah. And within that, yeah. there is to be appreciation 